Well, I want to start off with some gratitude. So thank you, Dave and Alexa, for hosting and the invitation. Um, I'm a lifelong Alaskan, and there's something about this time of year that is extra exciting and special when the sun is shining. And we know that there's millions of fish that are uh, on their way home, and it's just a really exciting time of year. So I want to spend some time with you today and share um, what I'm calling the mini states of Alaska salmon and people. And I want to start off with some important bright things to just keep in mind as we go on, because we are going to talk about some, some hard things and some sad times for some people. But the bright thing is that, you know, Alaska is still so unique anywhere in the world that the connections between salmon and people are still intact. And it might, we might take that for granted, but if you think about so many other places where salmon used to be king, those connections have been lost. And they are still intact here in Alaska because at the core, we have still functioning, intact, functional watersheds and habitat that produces salmon. And there's gonna be a whole bunch of scientists, uh, people who care, practitioners, next few days talking about the importance of this habitat. How do we protect it? How do we maintain it? Um, and it is something that's really special. And indeed, Alaska, compared to most other places, the footprint of humans in Alaska is really small. So this is a, a downscaled model. The dark blue are places that are functionally untouched by people, and the yellows and sort of the hotter colors are where there are more human activity. And indeed, Alaska, except for the road systems and sort of the urban hotspots like we're, we are now, are pretty much untouched. So the bright side is always that in Alaska that so many of our options are still open. We have so many choices left that we can make that many places, those choices have already been made for them and they're sort of stuck where they are. So that's the bright side. I just got some really bad news though. I just uh, checked my news feed and um, sad to say that Alaska Airlines Salmon 37 is now going extinct. Uh, so if you remember the plane that had the salmon on it, that is, that is flying its last flight. So I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news that that is going extinct. Uh, so shifting gears to the state of Alaska salmon, I wanna ask this question. So what are the current state or states of Alaska salmon? I wanna make sure that we don't miss the take home messages and that you know there is not one state of Alaska salmon. So I often get asked very meaningfully, say, can you come and share with us you know, the state of Alaska salmon, how they're doing? It's like, well, there's not one state. It depends on what species and what region, and it depends on how you measure it. So your assessment of how salmon are doing or how salmon and people are doing really depends on how you're quantifying it, what your metric of choice is, and we'll look at that a little bit. So those are a couple of take home messages that hopefully can uh, stay with you after we, we part. All right, so where might you go for information? So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this, and I'm sure salmon connected folks like you um, often have spent time on websites like this. Like if you're a thing like me that you know to go, some of the first places to go would be Alaska Department of Fish and Game. They have the, um, the privilege of managing salmon in Alaska. And so if you go to their landing page, go to fisheries page, you start finding a whole bunch of places, holes, a rabbit hole to start going down. And you quickly see that you know, these informations are divided into user groups, so commercial and sport, and subsistence, personal use, and so on and so on. So if you click on these things, you start seeing options like this. I don't know, I mean, even as a show of hands, so I know I'm talking about people, have, have, how many people have played with things like this, right? You go on the website, exactly. So you go on the website, you start clicking on things, it's like, oh, you can see the landings across the state. So you click on that, get excited. Sometimes it crashes. This is literally what happened when I was putting the talk together, right? So you refresh your browser and you can start pulling up graphs that sort of look like this. And so this is pretty impressive. So this is showing from 1985 to you know, last year, um, how many fish were estimated to have been caught across Alaska, broken apart by species? Huh, interesting, right? So you can start making some, some, some inferences that why it sure looks like pink salmon in terms of numbers are pretty important. Sockeye is pretty important and the other ones are less so. Gives you some sense of, wow, it doesn't really look like things are crashing to extinction. Interesting, if anything, it looks like things are pretty good, right? So it gives you some sense of what is happening based on estimated numbers of fish. And then but you can scratch your head and say, well, how about different regions? That's across the entire state. So you start breaking things apart. 
great tool. So you can split things out and say, well, I've heard of this place called Bristol Bay. And it seems like it's doing really well. And lo and behold, right, Bristol Bay, number of sockeye, breaking records, all time high, over 70 million fish last year, absolutely off the charts. All, and it's dominated by what color? Purple, all sockeye salmon. Sockeye salmon is king in Bristol Bay. And you can contrast that with what's going on in a place closer to home, Cook Inlet region, that people here probably care about, right? You get a really different story. There's some ups and downs, but it's, it looks like a very different trend. It's headed down. And the slice of purple that sockeye might be declining a bit, and the red that's pink, so the increase. So you get a different take on what's going on in these regions. And the other thing that I would like to highlight is that by looking at these things, they're informative, and there's always the risk that data, when viewed like this, can mask really important other trends. So if we think about Bristol Bay, Bristol Bay is an anomaly. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, and it should be maintained. And at the same time, Nushagak Chinook salmon, king salmon in the Nushagak, which is in Bristol Bay, they're really struggling. They're now a stock of concern. So like across the state, Chinook in Bristol Bay are struggling, they're failing to meet so even the lower bounds of escapement goals, these are the numbers of fish that we think are important in order for the population to, to produce or to maintain itself. And really missing sort of the goals for how many fish are wanted to be in the river for subsistence needs and sport fishermen's needs. I mean, really very clear signs of, of rapid declines. And so the point is thinking about, you know, when you look at these data, parsing it apart, reading sort of between the lines, between the data, you get different senses of what's the state of things depending on how you slice it and dice it. So again, not one state of Alaska salmon, there's many. And this story of Nushigak Chinook salmon versus sockeye is a true manager's dilemma. And it's one here on the Kenai that probably is a pretty familiar one of how do you catch the millions of available sockeye salmon to catch when they are co-mingled with far less abundant, less productive stocks of Chinook salmon. So how do you strike that balance, right? And that is a wicked dilemma, wicked, wicked dilemma. So picture that sort of sums that up, you know, three lovely sockeye and a, and a Chinook tagging along for fun, right? So it's a real manager's dilemma and something that um, Alaska is, is, I think, increasingly gonna be faced with as stocks like Chinook decline and sockeye continued to do fairly well. Okay, so I wanted to highlight a, another option for sources of information. Fish and Game is always my go-to resource for information, um, and I'm in a lucky position where I can email people like Adam or other friends, you know, and be like, well, can you send me this? What's, what's the story? And get info. But it's often difficult. And so I wanted to highlight this project um, that wrapped up uh, a couple years ago um, that's another source of information, and I feel like not enough people know about it. So it consumed about three years of my life, um, and it'd be great for people to know about it. So it's the State of Alaska Salmon and People, seems like an appropriate title. Um, it was a truly multidisciplinary, cross-cultural approach, about 150 people from tribes, NGOs, academics, management agencies, state and federal, tribal, really came together to look at a, a holistic view of the state of Alaska's salmon and people. Um, and we did similarly took this view that there's not one state, you have to break this apart by regions. And so if you go to the landing page, state of Alaska salmon and people, click on regions, it gives you a nice map, you could scroll over the map, pull up your favorite region, and then you have the option of essentially diving down and say, well, do you wanna look at sort of a shallow quick glance or a deeper dive? So you can toggle between different views where you can see there it's got the, uh, the choose your view. If you clicked on that button, it would drop down and say, you know, dive deep or just at a glance. And you can scroll through and there are various pieces that talk about the governance structure and how much values of landings and what species dominate and how much rainfall occurs in the system. It's really trying to be a holistic take region by region, and you can download these PDFs and start fires with them or do whatever you want with them, but there's, but there's lots of information here. And some of the data that you get from this, this is just an example graph, this is from the Cook Inlet region, is you know we didn't look at it yet, starting to parse the data more of beyond the numbers of fish that are caught, but who's interacting with those fish? What are the groups of people that are using the fish and interacting with the fish? Um, and so Cook Inlet, 
2010 to 2014, a whole bunch of fish that were caught just looking at which species are caught by which user groups. And you can see that, you know, the really abundant species, chum, pink, and sockeye, tend to be more commercial type fish. Overall, um, commercial um, catch the most fish, but you know, coho and chinook are really more of a sports fisherman's fish. So you get a different sense of how people are interacting with fish um, and, and their sort of relative importance. Similarly, beyond the numbers of fish, you can act, look at data things like, well, the uh, numbers of permits and the amount of money that permits are being made and how those permits are distributed among uh, rural or urban participants. And what we see in a lot of regions is that the number and value of permits in lots of regions is, t is tending to decline. And a lot of those permits are leaving um, rural areas or local communities and going to urban areas. Again, it gives you another take on the state of Alaska salmon when you address things like ownership and permit numbers and so forth beyond the numbers of fish. Okay, and it's really a treasure trove of data. Um, yes, I'm biased, but I would encourage you and hope that you would find some um, exciting stuff here. And there's this little red button that says access the data. And that will take you into another rabbit hole. It takes you to a whole other portal where you can access hundreds of data sets from across the state. Um, this is just the first ones that pop up when you do, but you know, commercial fishing, statistical areas from 2017, a whole bunch of you know, assembled weir counts, the abundance of salmon in the North Pacific 1925 to 2015, a whole bunch of different data sets. It's like, wow. And they are all archived there. They will live in perpetuity. They will live for a long time. Um, the, these data sets are published on this database. They have this sort of uh, unique identifier code, so you can, you can cite their citable data sources. And the really, for people that are interested in data and numbers, the really unique thing about this is that the metadata, so it's the data about the data, how they were collected, the methods that were used, the way that the, uh, uh, the, the filters that you were using for your statistical things that we're using to produce the data that you're looking at now, all kinds of steps that help you interpret the numbers that you're seeing are, are there and are identified. And that might not seem like a big deal, but the lack of metadata can really create challenges when you're using data from a whole bunch of disparate sources. You're not really sure where it came from. And it can make things challenging at best and lead to erroneous conclusions at worst, okay? So hopefully that's a new resource tool for you. Um, and I hope you like it. So I also wanted to give a call out to, and I think some, Nick is here, now Nick, um, some exciting graduate student projects that are based in, in Cook Inlet. Um, so I wanna give a call out to, so Ben Rich, who is working on this really pernicious problem of Northern pike that have been introduced to South Central Alaska. Pike are of course native to most of Alaska, north of the Alaska range and west of Alaska range introduced. They have spread, increasingly spreading. And Ben is really interested in asking the question of what's gonna happen regarding the impact between Northern pike and salmon, that pike really like eating juvenile salmon. That's true in a fact. What's gonna happen as things continue to warm up? So predators, like all cold water um, fishes, as things speed up, the metabolism speeds up, consumption is likely gonna go up. So how many more salmon potentially are gonna get eaten because of climate change? These are unknown questions that Ben is trying to tackle. In the spirit of warming, Madeline Lee, Maddie Lee, is working in the Nilchik and Kasilov Crooked Creek systems, really inspired by the summer of 2019 that if you're like me at all, remember that you're still kind of just now getting cool after the summer of 2019, it was so exceedingly warm. Maddie was interested in asking the question about heat stress and how warm temperatures might be impacting the reproductive performance um, and other things in Chinook salmon that are in, um, in the Nilchik and the Kisilof rivers. So using markers to actually measure heat stress in these systems. Um, paralleling some work that's been done on the, on the Yukon that I'll touch on, on briefly here. Um, Nick Jasek is giving a long overdue um, overview of the history and importance of the educational fishing net um, for the Kenaitse tribe, uh, a political ecology approach. Um, 
really doing a great job melding um, uh, social governance aspects in the salmon system work that we do. We often default to thinking about biophysical counts of fish, types of fish, and uh, don't give enough attention to the governance structures and political ecology aspects of these systems. So um, fantastic. And then uh, Andy Rothenberger, based in, um, in Homer, is interested in looking at how juvenile coho salmon are moving around patchworks of habitat in the Fox River. So it's the ri big river that drains into Ketchumac Bay up at the head of the bay. Um, asking him and looking into juvenile coho salmon habitat. So anyway, look out for those students. Maddie is giving a talk on Friday at the Science Symposium. So she'll be talking about some of her heat stress work. So um, hopefully some of you will see that and will stay tuned. So hopefully this first part has given you lots to think about. So maybe you dive into your computer after we leave. If you are at some part feeling like, well, I thought you were going to tell us what the state of things are. Well, the issue is it's still really complex. It's still really difficult. And the pieces are there. And I hope that I want to do it and from this is try to empower you too to have some of the tools to go in and start looking for yourself. Um, and as much as I would love to talk about only the bright spots, I'm trying to transition here. Um, my time in Fairbanks, um, I grew up in Anchorage, kind of making fun of Fairbanks, never thinking I would go there. So I now live in Fairbanks, and it's true. There's something about the spell of the Yukon um, of that system that can quickly get in your blood. And so I, I want to spend time talking about the, the, the Yukon at the moment. I know we're in Cook Inlet. It's a very different system. But I feel like what's going on for the people in the Yukon and the plight of the salmon there that is something that all Alaskans absolutely have to know. Um, there's a picture of my friend Ben Stevens in his fish camp in the middle Tanana or the middle Yukon River in the Yukon Flats. Um, in one of the years where they stood down, there were not enough fish to fish. So he's there at camp, sort of looking longingly at the river, but knowing that there's not enough fish to go around. So I want to spend some time talking about the Yukon. And so to set the stage, really what you need to know is that any way you slice or dice, these are the numbers of Chinook that are passing into the, into the river past the first place where they're really counted, um, about 100 miles or so upstream at Pilot Station, is that the numbers have gone up and down, but in recent past couple of years in particular, I mean, things have been gone really far down. So this past year, the, low, so the lowest record of counts on, on, on record and if we look at when the Alaska Department of Fishing game around 2013, 2012, it was across the state really clear that Chinook were struggling. Uh, and there was a massive initiative to start studying what's going on. And a lot of good work came out of that. Um, and it is also true just as a benchmark that despite learning a lot, we have learned a lot, I'm gonna to touch on some of this, um, things are not better, they've continued to get worse. And at the same time, this is sort of like insult to injury, that in the Yukon, chum salmon and Chinook salmon have often sort of offset each other, right? Sort of like when one was down, the other one was up. Bad luck as of right now that both chum salmon and Chinook salmon are down. So this, it's chum has never been a true substitute for Chinook salmon, they're very different. But summer chum in particular and fall chum are really also in the tank, okay? So the people there have very limited options. And the fact of the matter is there are people that do not have enough to eat in portions of the river. Very limited options. So in addition to the fish becoming less abundant, so they've shrunk both in number, but they've also shrunk in size. So again, this is my picture of my friend Ben from his fish camp. Not that long ago, he's gotten a little bit older, you can tell. But the fish have definitely gotten smaller. So these are the ones that, you know, you, you know, it's a time-honored tradition where you sort of measure, right, the size of your fish against your kids. I think that's, that's kind of consistent everywhere, right? So his kids have grown, but the fish have definitely gotten smaller. And this was um, sort of solidified. I mean, everyone on the river was saying it. Data came together. In these four little boxes represents about three years of work, and there's about 12 million individual recorded measured fish in these lines a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tears by fishing game techs and other things, measuring these fish across the state. So these are the four species of which we have data, and this is their average size through time. 
right? It's in a paper. You can read it, open access. But the point being is that they've all declined rapidly in size in the most recent years and have all shown some ups and downs, some synchrony or some like consistency in their declines in size and recoveries. But the general pattern is fish are smaller now and not just one species, but the species that we have data for. And this is across the state. So what's going on in the Yukon is not just a Yukon phenomenon. We're seeing this mirrored across the state. There's a river I think called the Kenai River. I think most people would agree that the size of Chinook have definitely declined in the Kenai as well. So what are some of the factors that explain these declines in abundance and size? Obviously, there's been a pile of effort into this. You can argue not enough, but there's been a lot of work to try to understand what are these drivers? How do we explain this? And ultimately, you know, is there anything that we can do about it? So there's things that emerge out of analyses, that emerge out of research. And one is there's a series of papers um, from across the North Pacific and some that are closer to home that are increasingly pointing to the fact that the ocean is an increasingly risky place. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act did wonderful things, right? So in the good old days, right, there was bounties on predators like harbor seals and sea lions. Uh, Killer whales, some places accepted, like close to Seattle, they're declining, but killer whales are actually rebounding and increasing in lots of areas. Salmon shark are cool. Seems like there's lots of them. We don't know that much about them. They do eat fish, they eat salmon, but we don't know, but there's lots of those too. The point is there are likely more predators in the ocean now than there has been likely in thousands of years, both because the decline of harvest of indigenous peoples that used to rely on things like seals but also the success of policies like the Marine Mammal Protection Act. I'm not saying we have to get rid of all the marine mammal predators. I'm saying this is one of the changes that has occurred in the system that we can assign some evidence to to say that it might be having some impact on abundance and size of salmon at the moment. There's also the fact that Alaska um, is a part of a bigger system that releases, well, all told, over 5 billion um, Pacific salmon are released into the North Pacific each year. So Alaska um, hovers around one and a half billion, some years quite a bit more. Um, the regions that do so, Prince William Sound in Southeast, where Prince William Sound is predominantly a pink salmon producing region, chum salmon a, um, from Southeast, right? And there's increasing evidence that there is competition and limited amount of capacity for feed and growth in the ocean. So when I went to school not long ago, we were literally taught that the ocean was a black box and it was limitless. And neither of those things are any longer true. So we can see the evidence both in analyses like this that I already showed you. So these four panels, the only factor that fell out that was consistent explaining the ups and downs of the four species in this analysis was the abundance of Alaska pink salmon. So when Alaska pink salmon were high, the size of the other species tended to go down. Is that causal? Was it a correlation? But it's not sure, but it is consistent with what you would expect if there's limited food and competition. And as ecologists, I believe that there is competition for limited resources. When resources are limited, there can be competition. And then another paper led by Curry Cunningham, he's now a, a professor in my own department at the University of Alaska. Um, showing here um, that the abundance of hatchery chum salmon, these are from, from Asia, they've been in the news quite a bit lately for other aspects of things, but they were actually associated with the decline in survival of Yukon-based Chinook salmon. So when Asian chum salmon were doing well, Alaska Chinook salmon tended to do poorly. That was based on survival. Again, is it causal? I don't know. But when you start having more and more of these studies emerging, it's not just one study, it becomes sort of a weight of evidence of what emerges out of these, and there's some consistencies of what's emerging out of these analyses. We've also asked these questions, and it appears that we can explain some of the shifts in the loss of some of the older, biggest individual Chinook salmon, right? That's really what we've lost, so those fish that spend a lot of time in the ocean get really big. And the idea is that the ocean is not as safe as it used to be. It's more a dangerous place. And we can explain the changes in age structure through time if we look at selective mortality on fish late in their life. So we have to do this because you can't be out there easily following fish around, but we can statistically model this. 
Um, and if we exert sort of size selective predation, particularly on fish that are in their third ocean age, so these pe people that, you know, troll for kings in the winter, or whatever, they're the, the first fish that's like, oh, that's a really nice fish, right? It's the first like 12 to 15 pound fish. That's a three ocean fish, right? Those are the ones that seem to become more selected by things like salmon sharks from tagging evidence we have, that once you're a three-year-old plus fish, predators tend to prefer you. It's hard to blame them. I do, right? They also, less work, more fat per fish, all kinds of things, exactly. There's also selective, um, unintentional, but selective mortality from things like pollock bycatch, right? That they tend to also catch fish that are about those age. So regardless of the mechanisms, selective mortality on some of those older fish can explain the drop in the age classes that are important. Okay, so, so why does this matter? Well, it matters because that fish size, as fish get smaller, it reduces our reproductive potential. So larger fish, particularly larger females, both produce more eggs, but also larger eggs. So this is what it's showing is through time, the number of eggs that are in, an, in female Chinook salmon, this is in the Yukon, and also the size of those, those eggs. So the egg mass, it's the total size of her ovaries. And the estimates here are that you know, a 15% loss results in a 28% or so decline in productivity. So the point is that you have disproportionate declines of reproductive potential if you have declines in body size. So really what is this suggesting is the importance of big, fat, old female fish, particularly in the case where abundance is going down and the size of the fish is going down. That's, that's a really, beyond a double whammy, that's rather an unfortunate pattern. So some of the things we've also seen back to 2019, that the Yukon is now historically warm. So it's one of the fascinating ones where I go to these, some of these, um, these workshops and I'll be in a room that with you know, Western scientists that like to play with temperature loggers like myself and put, put them out in the streams and record things and we say things like, well, we don't have any temp, we don't know about temperature change in the Yukon. And local people will look at you like, in, like are you crazy? It's way warmer now because we swim in it. They go swimming. They're like, when I grew up, they're like elders. And when I grew up on the Yukon, if you fell in the river, you are dead, right? It was freezing cold. And now they're swimming, right? And so all this stuff lines up that the Yukon is historically warm. And in 2019, the year that really just broke everything open, um, there were widespread die-offs, pre-spawning mortality, particularly for summer chum salmon in rivers like the Kayakuk, tributaries of the Yukon. But there were also a lot of sort of missing fish that we expected were gonna make it to Canada that didn't really show up. And at about the same time, research that was led by Vanessa Von Vila and USGS, she continues to work on this, really documenting quantifying heat stress in these populations of Chinook and indeed showing at the temperatures that they are experiencing in these rivers, they are absolutely showing signs of heat stress. What that means, what the consequences are, those are great questions we don't totally know. But we absolutely do know if 2019 is anything like what our future might look like, it suggests that salmon in the Yukon are gonna have a hard time. <sighs> to maybe add salt to the wound, this past few years, in addition to the numbers of Chinook salmon going down, ichthyophonus is a naturally occurring pathogen parasite. They acquired it in, through their diet in the ocean in ways we don't totally understand. But the rate at which individuals are infected with this parasite, um, as measured by the fish that are sort of in the middle river as they're headed upstream, is crazy high. So just as sort of 2020, 21, like 44%, 38%, 34% of fish that are passing the middle river. And the issue is that ichthyophonus attacks cardiac tissue, so it's a little bit hard to see. This is a heart, and there's white dots, lesions. Um, their cardiac tissue is attacked by the parasite, and so you have fish that are migrating thousands of miles through a muddy river. They're athletes, and they have a parasite that's attacking their cardiac and their ability to move oxygen through their bodies. That's not good. And on top of it, of course, it is also warmer, meaning that they require more oxygen um, because the water holds 
their, their metabolism higher and the water holds less oxygen. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening here that is hard to feel good about. Um, so this is a picture of student Keith Ivey. He's a, a compatriot with, uh, with Nick at UAF in the DeMumta program, working with locals um, to try to understand what are the, the consequences, mortality consequences and the patterns of infection of ichthyophonus um, uh, in Yukon Chinook. At the same time, the Yukon is historically warm. Ichthyophonus is historically high. What hasn't changed is that the fish are still having to swim a really, really long ways. So that migration is still historically long. Um, and salmon know no borders. Um, so it is a true international uh, challenge and sometimes feels like an international tragedy where, you know, up above the border of Canada, the local people have not fished for two decades, essentially two decades of zero harvest. Um, and it's really trickling down and we're seeing essentially our turn on the, our side of the border. Um, yeah, it's hard to talk straight about this when people are really tied to the resource and are really suffering. So one of the final things that I, you know, I often think about, and it's an uncomfortable last factor of how we got to where we are, but I'm gonna put it out there and I'm gonna say that it's hubris. And I'm gonna say that maybe I'm one of the first to say that I'm guilty of being arrogant and thinking that things are gonna be just fine. I was trained you know, that salmon are really tough and I actually still largely think that. Salmon aren't canaries in coal mine. They're incredibly resilient. If you give them half a chance, they'll make it and find a way. And I was thought that if you take your foot off their neck, keep the habitat largely in good shape, that salmon will come back. And that's largely been done. The habitat in the Yukon is still largely there. There's things that could be better, yes, but compared to the Columbia River or the Sacramento, I mean, it's totally intact, right? People have burdened conservation cross for a long time, have not been fishing, and it's still continued to get worse. And so it makes me worry and makes me question about whether we as Alaskans were truly willing to accept, you know, what might be coming for us. So even in the lack of, of having a lot of human disturbance on the landscape, anything that looks like the lower 48, Salmon in a place like the Yukon that's as wild twice the size of Texas as a watershed, fish are at historically low numbers. And so while habitat preservation might be necessary at this case, it may not be sufficient either. So I hope, I don't wanna leave you on a, on a sour note, but I do feel all Alaskans need to know what's going on in the Yukon. And there are other systems where people are suffering from a lack of, of fish. I still think the advice is well suited that what can we do? We have certain numbers of level, level, levers we could pull and things that are within our control. Always we should be trying to preserve and manage for diversity. We know that's important. Try to maintain habitat as much as we can and give them a chance um, and continue to be as optimistic as we can. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with that. Maybe we'll transition into uh, a panel discussion and thanks again for, for the invitation.